deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one. It's an important part of the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Why would he include this in his prayer?
us this morning. We love you, Jesus. Hey, Sugarloaf, I'm Andy Lett, lead pastor of the Fountain Church, and this is your weekly What's Happening update. Ash Wednesday is coming up on March 2nd. And on Ash Wednesday, Sugarloaf and the Fountain Church are coming together for a special combined worship service here at Sugarloaf at 7 p.m. I wanna invite you to come. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the Lent season. Lent is the 40-day journey, not counting Sundays, that lead up to Easter. Lent is a season of repentance, fasting, reflection, and ultimately celebration. The 40-day period represents Jesus' temptation in the wilderness where he fasted and where Satan tempted him. And so during the Lent season, we're invited to pray, fast, and to draw closer to Jesus. During the Ash Wednesday service, we'll focus on prayer and repenting of our sins, and near the end of the service, you'll be invited to receive ashes on your forehead. This is to remind us of our own mortality, that we are all dust and to dust we will return. But also we're reminded of how much we need God's saving grace. All of this will prepare us to celebrate the joy of Easter. On Sunday, March 6th, the Fountain and Sugarloaf will come together for one combined worship service at the Fountain Church campus. So no services will be held at Sugarloaf on March 6th. It's, it's a special day of worship because the Fountain will celebrate our 10th birthday as a church, and we wanna invite you to celebrate that with us together. We also offer fun, creative kids ministry experiences during the service, so bring your family, your kids will love it. After the service, plan to stay after for a pizza party lunch for everybody. Plus, we'll have some bounce houses and cupcakes and all sorts of fun things. This is a great opportunity to get to know people from both churches. If you want to learn more about the potential partnership with Sugarloaf and the Fountain Church, stay after worship. We'll host a town hall meeting to help answer your questions, to hear your thoughts, and to talk about any next steps. Pastor Heather and I will be leading the town hall along with representatives from Sugarloaf's merger steering team. Save the date for Sunday, March 20th. On that Sunday, each congregation from Sugarloaf and the Fountain will get to vote on the proposed merger of both churches. In order to be eligible to vote, you must be an official member of one of the churches and you must be physically present to vote on that day. So if you are not currently a member or if you're not sure, but you would like to become one, contact Pastor Heather or Terry Strawn by email or phone as soon as possible. To vote, you must join the church on or before Membership Celebration Sunday on March 13th. Exciting things are happening here at Sugarloaf. That's all I have for you this week. We'll see you again next week for more of what's happening here at Sugarloaf. And now, why don't we move into a time of giving? I want to thank you for your financial generosity here at Sugarloaf. When you give, you are literally partnering with God to make an eternal investment to help transform people's lives. Your giving helps make ministry happen here at Sugarloaf and literally around the world through our mission partners. So let's bow our heads together and pray as we ask God to bless this offering. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are so generous to us. God, you gave your one and only son so that we could have life and what an opportunity we have to take the resources you've placed in our lives and to turn those around to be generous toward you for the sake of the world. I pray that you would bless every gift and every giver, that you would use not only our finances, but you would use our very lives as we pull together to accomplish your mission, that you would use us so that we could build up your kingdom here on this earth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, it's hard to believe, but it is our final week of our Talking with God series. And this door is one to a relationship with God and our conversations with God. One that I hope and pray are more fruitful and deep than ever before coming to this point in our journey. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and in that prayer, he included these words, deliver us from evil. Why would he include that in the prayer he taught his disciples if there wasn't something to it? I think the problem of evil that we all encounter in the world is evident. No one would doubt that there is evil in the world. And God has provided for us a, a defense. And prayer plays a significant part in that defense. So before we dig in today, in this conversation about evil and spiritual warfare, let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your grace we thank you that you have not left us alone, but that, Lord, you counsel us, that you have empowered us by your Holy Spirit, that you have given us authority, and that ultimately, God, you provide all that we need. Lord God, we pray as we open your word today and have this conversation that we need to have about the, the spiritual battle that we all find ourselves in the midst of. Would you speak powerfully to your people? Would you embolden them in who you are and who you have created them to be as your children? Lord, would you speak to us? Your servants are listening. It's in Christ's name that we pray it. And the church said, Amen. Amen. There is evil in the world. I think that there's no question uh, in any of our minds that that is the truth. There is an enemy attached to that evil as well. And the vast majority of people that have ever lived uh, recognize the reality of evil. But we're not defenseless. God has not left us vulnerable. There are those who certainly see the devil around every corner. I, I know some of those folks. And that those that are seemingly unaware that it, there is a spiritual battle taking place uh, around us. How about you? Where do you fit into those extremes? The devil is responsible for everything or there is no devil, uh, there is no evil, or you know, humankind is all that is evil. Some might argue that. Uh, C.S. Lewis observes in his uh, widely acclaimed book, Screw Tape Letters, uh, this. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialistic or a magician with the same, a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Uh, there are two books in my own life, in my own reading, that really drove this home for, for me, and another um, that I will commend to you as well. One is C.S. Lewis's Screw Tape Letters, um, fascinating uh, revelation of the, the spiritual battle that we all find ourselves in the midst of, and a, 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 book, a work of fiction um, by the author Frank Peretti, who wrote a two-part series called uh, the, this Present Darkness and Piercing the Darkness that brought this to light. Another fabulous uh, study on the reality of uh, spiritual warfare is something called the bondage breaker. So I, I commend those things to you. Scripture is clear that uh, spiritual warfare and evil are a reality. Uh, what do we do? Uh, and what does prayer have to do with this battle that we find ourselves in the midst of? How has God equipped us and empowered us for these situations and circumstances? <clears throat> it's really interesting because it, it's brought to light powerfully in a story in uh, the book of Daniel, in Daniel's prophecy. 
where the unseen battle is, is, is brought to light, um, even for him in a new um, and un unexpected way. And the significance of prayer in that battle is, is something that I want us to hear as I read these words from, from Daniel's prophecy. So I'm in a Daniel chapter 10. <clears throat> and um, this, this opens in, um, this chapter opens with uh, the, the subtitle, Daniel's Vision of a Man. Now, beginning at verse 2, it says, At that time I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. He is in despair. He has gotten a particular message and he is in mourning. He's gotten a, a vision of sorts. Um, it says, I ate no choice food, no meat or wine touched my lips, and I used no lotions at all until the three weeks were over. Okay, just a little context there, right? Daniel is one of these young men that's been taken into captivity, and he is um, with a, a select group of young men uh, that are being, um, you could call them indoctrinated into a Babylonian society. And um, so he's, been, he's, he's being treated in a particular way, in a really good way. He's being fed the finest foods and, and given all of the finer things in life um, so that he might end up bowing to this king rather than uh, the, the only king forever, uh, God. So it goes on to say um, he, he's mourning, he's, he's fasting, um, he is seeking God in prayer for uh, some re revelation of what this vision means. And it says, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I looked up and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of a burnished bronze and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left, but my face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I've come in response to them. Since the first day that Daniel began to pray for understanding, to seek God, he was on his way, this angel uh, on his way to Daniel in response. The scripture goes on to say, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. It's powerful to consider that, G that, that Daniel began to pray for wisdom and understanding. And from the day he began to pray, an angel was sent. And yet this angel was sent to appear to him, to, to, to help him understand what God was about to do, and yet he was delayed. He had to contend, he had to fight to be there with Daniel. This unseen battle going on as Daniel sought God in prayer. It's a powerful representation of this unseen reality all around us, sometimes more obvious than others. Uh, let him who has eyes see. So we're told in, uh, in the New Testament and in Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we have not been left uh, defenseless or, or vulnerable to, these, uh, to this battle, to this attack that we are all in the midst of. There is an enemy, and the enemy wants only to, to kill and steal and destroy. 
uh, so we're told in, um, in the scriptures as well. But if we look at uh, Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we read that God has not left us uh, defenseless, but has given us authority and armor to put on. Uh, God's word says this in uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Here God provides armor, and not only armor to defend ourselves, but we're also given two pieces of armor that are our offensive weapons, right? Weapons for our offense. We, we don't only have to play defense, but we've been, given, um, we've been given the opportunity to play offense as well. Not just wait for the attack, but to, to charge into battle with weapons of armor that God has given us. And these, these two items are different. There's the sword, right? The word of God. And, and again, it just, it, it invites us and implores us to be familiar with this word, to study this word, to, to, to eat, eat the word of God so that we might become, it might become a part of who we are. And then the feet of peace, the shoes of the gospel and proclaiming the good news of God's victory in whatever battle it is that we are, are fighting Though we still have battles to fight, we know the ultimate victory is God. We live in between the resurrection of Christ and the return of Christ as we live into the already not yet culmination of God's kingdom here on earth. Uh, N.T. Wright, who is a New Testament scholar, reminds us that because of what Jesus did on the cross, the powers and authorities are a beaten defeated lot. Sounds like an English gentleman, doesn't he? So that no one who belongs to Jesus need be overawed by them again. Now, I I don't know about you, but it seems to me that um, I've said this in many conversations with folks over these last weeks and months, the devil's having a field day. There certainly seems to be a, a chink in our armor and, and whenever one of us, one amongst us, friends, family, community of faith seems to take one hit, uh, the, the, the enemy sees a vulnerable place um, and, and attacks and takes another chink and another chink and another chink. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. Even in my own life, um, the reality of the spiritual forces of wickedness that we uh, recognize in our own baptisms have been at work and at play in ways that I have never experienced before. James uh, says this in, in chapter 4, verse 7, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you do that? 
How do you put on the shoes of the gospel? How do you pray as a, as a victor? Uh, well, ultimately, we know who wins. And we're called to live in that victory, to remind one another that we live in that victory, to, to recognize the places where uh, the devil's getting a foothold in the life of another. So there's three things that I encourage us to do as we uh, recognize the reality of the spiritual battle that we all are in, uh, whether we are aware of it or not. And the first one is to pray, to pray, to listen for where the spiritual forces of, of darkness are at work around you and to pray the opposite. And to even be, as my friend says, uh, put sneakers on those prayers, to be uh, attentive, to act in opposition to wherever that darkness might be. So where you see sickness, hopelessness, despair, brokenness, grief, lack of self-worth, that we pray kingdom-focused prayers over these situations and even embody those prayers. So where people are, are, are lonely, that we offer our company. Where people don't understand or recognize their own self-worth, we remind them that God thought they were so worthy that he sent his one and only son to die for them, that they were made with a purpose, on purpose, for relationship with their creator. Where there is sickness, can we be instruments of healing in some way? Where there is a lack of self-worth, how can we help people anchor their identity in Christ? Where there is hunger, where can we feed people? These are all signs and foretastes of the kingdom of God where we're told in the book of Revelation that there is no hunger, there is no loneliness, there are no tears, there is no pain, there is no suffering. How can we be um, visible representations of that kingdom and pray God's kingdom would come in whatever that situation or circumstance is? So we pray it, we practice it, we recognize the armor that we have been given um, and the defensive mechanisms that are a part of that armor, but also the, 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 the opportunities to, to play offense, to, to go ahead and not wait for the attack, but to work offensively, to remember that Jesus defeated Satan by quoting scripture back to Satan. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. And as we commit to memory and understanding the word of God, we have a powerful weapon against uh, the enemy. And then finally, this other uh, piece of armor that helps us to play offensive line is the, the shoes of peace or the, the, the feet of the gospel to bring good news, to proclaim the power and the victory of God, to remember and remind others that the enemy has already been defeated. We know how the story ends. There is victory. But as C.S. Lewis will remind us in his book, The Screwtape Letters, these battles in the meantime are a distraction, a distraction from who you are and who God is, and God's kingdom coming all the time. In Luke uh, chapter 11, there's this odd story where Jesus has cast out uh, demons uh, to a man that was mute, and he, his voice is, is restored. The crowd is amazed, but then he's accused of casting out these demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Jesus' response beginning at verse 17 is this. Jesus knew their thoughts. That's scary. <laughs> Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? 
So then, they will be your judges. And then listen to this. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Jesus is saying here, this strong man, this evil, this demon, this Satan, when he attacks, he is fully armed and he guards his own house and his possessions are safe. And yet, when Jesus drives out demons, he does it by the finger of God. Full armor, strong man, finger, finger of God. It's a powerful witness to the power of God. Jesus describes the enemy as a strong man, fully armed. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away that armor in which the man trusted. On the one hand, we have a finger, and on the other, a fully armed, strong man. And here's a spoiler alert. The finger wins. The finger is more powerful than this fully armed, strong man, lest we are confused or dismayed about the, the battle that we find ourselves in the midst of. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead has overwhelmed death and the grave, lives in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We too, we too, by the finger of God, have far more power in us than any strong man, than any enemy. The battle belongs to God. We, we have all we need to fight. So as we consider this new relationship, this new level, this new layer, this new understanding in our conversations with God, we are invited to embody that, to live that out, to walk that out. As I said last week, the people in the room had the invitation to, to walk into this new relationship, this new level of relationship with God, one that is, is deepened and nurtured and grown in conversation with God. So if you, um, if you even have a doorway in your house, that you want to walk from one room to the next to, to say, God, I am ready to take our relationship to the next level. I'm ready to, to, to seek you in prayer, to, to listen and to respond. God, I, I am ready to petition on, on my own behalf and to intercede on behalf of others in prayer. God, I just want to sit with you and be quiet to be still and know that you are God and be reminded that I don't have to hold the whole world on my shoulders, but that you hold it in your hands. Whatever it is that has resonated with you over the course of these eight weeks, are you ready to take the next step in your relationship and your conversations with God? Walk through that door and say, God, here I am like the small boy Samuel who heard the voice of God, here I am. Uh, this is the end of our Talking with God series, but next week we begin a new series called For the Kingdom, and we are worshiping with our brothers and sisters at the Fountain Campus. So we will not be here in person. Uh, we certainly will be online. Pastor Andy Lett will be bringing us the first message of that series for the kingdom as we lean into the kingdom possibilities of bringing these two churches together and all of the excitement and momentum uh, that is building around this. We hope that you will join us in person as they celebrate their 10th birthday. There's going to be a bit of a, a party and a celebration after worship too on their campus. So look for more information about that here online. Hey, how about this? 
how about uh, together we pray the Lord's Prayer, which has truly been the anchor for these eight weeks together and truly is the anchor for our lives as followers of Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'll see y'all next week.